Hey guys, welcome back. Today I've got quite a few new juicy Halo Infinite story details that should cover quite a lot of what happened in between the intro of the game with the Infinity being assaulted and the actual beginning of the game when Chief wakes up. There's quite a big six month time gap there and we've not really known much about what happened during that time gap besides the fact that the UNSC fought the Banished, but thanks to the new book, Halo the Rubicon Protocol, we've got a lot more details about what happened on the ring during that time. Now, just to preface this video, it's not going to be a review of the book. I'm just going to be going over the major details that were covered in it about that time gap. So if you want to read the book for yourself, then don't watch this video anymore. Spoilers from here on in. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Okay, right. I've said that enough times now. If you're still watching, then you probably want to know the details. Oh yeah, also real quick before we start, um, if the editing in this video seems a little bit lazy at times, I sprained my wrist the other day lifting. Um, so using a mouse right now and doing those repetitive actions isn't the easiest of tasks, so just bear with me for this video. So I gotta say, I really, really enjoyed this book. It felt kind of like Halo Infinite's version of The Flood. Like how The Flood added background context and meaning and kind of background info to Halo Combat Evolved and its story and made you realize that there were other things going on on Alpha Halo in the background whilst you were playing the campaign. Rubicon Protocol is kind of like that for Halo Infinite, which, considering The Flood is actually one of my favorite Halo books, made me really, really enjoy this book. Like I said, it doesn't retcon or change any details about Infinite's campaign, rather it just kind of adds context to certain things and certain locations and things that you find in the open world. It just fleshes out the experience even more and is a great kind of companion story. I will say one thing that I really liked about this book is how dark of a picture it painted of the war on Zeta Halo. It's kind of light and fluffy in the game in a way. There's the odd dark moment like with Hudson, but for the most part, it's pretty light and fluffy. This book is not even remotely light and fluffy. Like, it's the complete polar opposite of light and fluffy. If anything, I kind of wish Infinite Story had more kind of vibe and atmosphere that this book has. Very graphic, very violent, and very visceral. I was gonna say at times, but it's not even at times. It's ready for the most of the book. The author, Kelly Gay, did a fantastic job with this book. All of her books so far for Halo have been great, but I'm not gonna lie, I think Rubicon Protocol might just be my favorite. I really, really enjoyed this book. So let's go over all of the major details that I picked out of the book. Just a quick reminder, spoiler alert ahead. If you haven't read the book yet and you wanna go in spoiler free, then obviously don't watch anymore. So, the Infinity, when it went down, had around 7,000 crew, which, if you want to compare it to the Pillar of Autumn, which is very similar in how it goes down to a ring, only had around, I don't know, 2,500-ish personnel, I think, on board, so obviously the Infinity was a lot bigger, there were a lot more crew on it. During the infamous four-minute siege on the Infinity, it was absolute chaos across the entire ship like we saw in the cutscene. There's a contingent of sabers that are attached to the Infinity, so I'm guessing they aren't so secret anymore, that Fireteam Windfall used to defend the ship's Spartans and ODSTs as they dropped to Zeta Halo in drop pods. Fireteam Intrepid, consisting of Spartans Wheeler and Horvath and possibly some others that we don't know, focused on taking out banished scouting parties, supply vehicles, patrols, and supply lines as soon as they made ringfall. Now, as for the status of the Infinity, well, uh, it's still out there. Somewhere, maybe? I mean, its current status and whereabouts are actually never confirmed in the book. Characters just kind of speculate about it, and the same goes for Lasky and Palmer and Horsey and Blue Team and Locke, etc, etc as well. All the characters do in this book is speculate slash speak about like rumours going around camps and squads they run into on Zeta Halo about their whereabouts. The only slight bit of hard information we know about any of this is regarding Lasky. Fireteam Taurus, led by Spartan Hudson Griffin, escorted Lasky onto a dropship aboard the Infinity, and after that, nobody knows where he went or his whereabouts on the ring, even Griffin, who got him on the dropship. At no point are any of these characters in the book either, besides right at the start, where they're coming over the Infinity's intercom, that kind of stuff. So, I'd say short term, just to give an opinion real quick. Short term, I think this kind of sucks. It's still a bit annoying not knowing what's happened to these major characters, and you'd think that of all the stories to tell us their whereabouts and their status post-Infinite, it'd be this one. However, at the same time, I'm actually really happy that this book doesn't tell us any of that, because that's information that should be presented in a game, not in a book. So as much as it sucks still not knowing what any of them are doing or where they are, I think long term it's for the best. 
Spartan Nina Coven and Benita Stone of Fireteam Shadow ran the Hive Mind Trials, as they're called, for the Hive Mind Mjolnir set on Anvil Station, which is a set of armor designed specifically for Spartans that are assigned to flood containment operations, which means that Coven and Stone, who we unfortunately find dead in Halo Infinite, have been trained for flood containment breaks, which is very interesting. Given that Nina Coven is still alive, Fingers crossed, at some point we run into her on Zeta Halo, whether it's in DLC or whatever, and she has to put that flood containment operation training to use. I can only hope. So, Spartan Horvath gets separated from the rest of Fighteam Intrepid when Cortana destroys the ring, and that event was a total surprise to all of the allies on the surface. As the ring explodes, Horvath gets stranded from his squad because he's on a different island, and that island actually gets flipped upside down by the damage, which is pretty cool. And as soon as the damage to the ring occurs, Zeta Halo enters Slipface and is taken to an unknown location as a safety protocol to ensure the rest of the ring isn't destroyed. Horvath watches some banished hunting wildlife on Zeta Halo, and he goes on to elaborate that most of the wildlife on Zeta Halo has actually been hunted to extinction by the banished, which is maybe why we didn't see any them in Infinite, even though the obvious reason is they were cut from the game. Uh, he says that their modus operandi is to aggressively harvest every possible resource from an area, laying waste to the entire thing in the process, and then they move on to the next area to do the same thing. It's said that most systems on Zeta Hilo remained intact following the damage that Cortana inflicted to the ring, besides the failing environment containment field. Now, I have no idea what this is, and it actually doesn't elaborate on it any further in the book, it just kind of says it then moves on, but the phrase containment field just immediately gets my attention for reasons that I don't think I need to go into. Horvath then runs into a super high-ranking brute called Gorion, a three-meter-tall blood star who actually becomes something of an interesting rival for him. In the crashed phantom that Horvath finds Gorion in, there's more of the stone forerunner rings being transported, likely to Annex Ridge, which I believe was where you could find them being studied by the banished in-game. It was that one camp where the stone rings were kind of erected into the center of the camp. Uh, Gorion is also the only other survivor on this upside-down ring island beside Horvath. So, the two briefly form a truce to try and fly a sentinel across the gap of space to get over to the next island and reunite with their respective factions. In preparation for this, he ends up spending Christmas Eve and also Christmas Day stranded on Zeta Hilo on the upside down island with Gorion, and at one point he jokes about how the brute hadn't even bothered to get him a Christmas present. Now, needless to say, but Gorion has no idea what Christmas is. The two do eventually commandeer a sentinel that they free from beneath the wreckage of a phantom to fly across the gap to another island, and as soon as they land, they start fighting, and Gorion wins, but he lets Horvath live and ultimately rendezvous with Jaeger. Later on, Gorion is present in the Foundation facility with Jaeger when he kills Spartan Stone, and after that, he's also present at the final battle the characters have at a beam tower, where he faces off against Horvath one final time. This time, armed with a brute shot and a bandolier, which is a very cool Halo 2 style aesthetic. I like that a lot. I really wish we'd seen that in game. But of course, after a bloody fight, as you can imagine, Horvath eventually gets his revenge and kills Gorion. But more about that stuff later on. After almost a week of scattered survival on the ring, Spartan Vedrana Makovic manages to establish a rendezvous point at the crash site of the UNSC Mortal Reverie Frigate, and a good number of UNSC survivors rally there. Survivors from the Navy, Army, Marines, ODSTs, Spartans, crew, and more. The element of survival is actually really strong in this book, and at times it gets pretty desperate for the survivors as well, far more so than the game makes it seem. It makes the game almost seem a bit too happy and just optimistic in comparison to how it really was on the ring. Crew members and troopers go starving, they walk for miles on broken bones and with major injuries, and start losing it mentally and get like bouts of depression at times. I'm not gonna lie, there are some parts in this book where it gets like really, really dark, which I actually in hindsight would have liked to have seen at times in the game. However, the formation of the campsite at the Reverie was like a massive burst of morale for the survivors. The ship was broken, but it was still relatively intact, meaning that its quarters could still be used for sleeping, for eating, for medical checkovers and the like, and there's even a scene where the crew members get pizza, which really does brighten the mood, as you can imagine. What doesn't brighten the mood, though, is the bin of dog tags that they're presented with as soon as they arrive at the site. 
A bin that, mind you, is pretty much full to the brim, which is a pretty dark vision. At the Reverie, the crew are trained in guerrilla warfare by the Spartans and ODSTs and other troopers, so if worse comes to worse, they can hold their own against the Banished, or at least they can try. During the initial ambush, the Infinity launched communication satellites in orbit of the Ring to try and provide overwatch during ringside warfare. And to monitor for closer range Banished activity, the characters had to restore the link between FOBs, which were also deployed by the Infinity, which is exactly what we had to do in-game, restoring the FOBs to show where local high-value targets were, where the Marine squads were, etc, etc. However, because Zeta Helo jumped through a portal to a different location when it was damaged, any melee signal that the Infinity put out when it was attacked was now essentially useless because the ring was in a completely different place, which meant that no reinforcements were going to be coming to Zeta Helo anytime soon. Despondent Pyre was yet to interfere with the ring's affairs, despite the damage that had been done to her ring, and later we find out that that's because Cortana had her sequestered and the submonitors were trying to free her. We find out that the Banished are using both blisterbacks and shrouds on Zeta Halo, which has me crossing my fingers that maybe at some point we'll get them both in Halo Infinite, the blisterback in particular. We also find out that the native language of the Banished is Sangheili, or Elite, however it's Sangheili with a heavy brute dialect, which is rather interesting. There's also quite a lot of infighting within the Banish, with clans trying to overthrow each other constantly, but Esherim is the only thing that's keeping them in check. And so, Spartan Griffin, the leader of Fight Team Taurus, plans an assassination operation on Esherim, because if he's dead, and all that war happened to break out between the UNSC and the Banished, then the Banished having no strategic leader would mean almost certain victory for the UNSC because of just how disorganised the Banished were without him. This book really paints the picture that Esherim is almost the only one keeping the Banished intact on Zeta Halo. Spartans Griffin, Sarkar, Panago, and Malik head out on the assassination op, but as we know, this operation fails miserably, and all the Spartans are killed besides Griffin, who is kept in the tower and tortured by Chaklok. And then, as a consequence, Esherim finds the location of the camp at the Reverie and launches an all-out assault on it. Now, the assault on the Reverie is actually framed really, really well. It begins at night time with all the troopers and able-bodied fighters out front in makeshift fortifications, and the other crew members sheltering inside the ship with a mountain pass behind that they can flee to if need be. I'm not gonna lie, the framing and the build-up to this fight really gave me Helm's Deep vibes. The battle at the Reverie goes on for a day and a half. The UNSC are outnumbered 100 to 1 and, as expected, get demolished. They do use Wolverines, which I thought was kind of cool, but they don't do enough to stop the Banished. A lot of the battle scenes here are really, really graphic, like people getting their limbs entirely crushed, blood spewing from their torsos and the like. It really doesn't hold back in this book, which I enjoyed. During the assault, the Banished Mortar the Reverie, which finally destroys the ship, and eventually the survivors are forced to give up the makeshift base and flee into the wilderness with no rally point. Tremonius, the brute chieftain that led the Banished forces in the assault, is gifted the base, and thus, the Reverie camp becomes Outpost Tremonius. Any KIA Marines or Spartans at the Reverie were taken by the Banished, with their gear being repurposed. They also use signal jammers to prevent pretty much any and all communications. In the main group of survivors that the book follows, to save Spartans Coven, Stone, and the other crew members, combat medic Lucas Browning gives himself up to the Banished, very Merian Pippin style, and ultimately is thrown into a war skiff. Now, the war skiff, I'm pretty sure, is a vehicle that we're either going to be getting at some point in Infinite, or that was cut, because there's not only a Mega Bloks model of it that was released like a year and a half, two years ago at this point, but there's also a destroyed model of the skiff itself in the open world in Infinite, and it's been mentioned quite a few times. I think it was in Shadows of Reach, and of course, it's being mentioned here again. Anyway, back to Lucas. He's taken to the Redoubt of Sundering a processing camp for prisoners, and is stored with other human POWs before they're all inspected by a human banished member, which, as you'd expect, causes immense psychological pain and distress to the prisoners. Now, humans are accepted into the banished, it's not like the Covenant where the humans are the number one enemy of the faction, that's not the case. However, there's growing discontent within the banished, and also quite a lot of contention between the humans and the other brutes in the banished after Cortana destroyed Doizak. Obviously, Cortana was a human creation, and so by proxy, the brutes blame humanity for their homeworld being destroyed. The prisoners at the Redoubt of Sundering are called. 
the weak are executed, gassed by methane, and the strong are taken to the tower to be tortured. At one point, Spartan prisoners are brought out, and they're treated horrifically. When I said this this book doesn't, doesn't pull any punches, I wasn't kidding. So their armor is torn off violently, which, if they weren't already dead, pretty much deals the killing blow. And then, once the Spartans are dead, their bodies are used for target practice, they're defiled, disgraced, and this is literally quoting the book, by the way, treated like trash. Esherim's intelligent leadership had the banished employing psychological warfare like this as well as physical warfare, which of course isn't the typical thing for brutes. I gotta say, it really feels like a lot of these kind of graphic banished brute torture scenes have taken some inspiration from the story stomping on the heels of a fuss from, I think it was Halo Evolutions. That was an incredibly graphic story about how brutes treated human prisoners and this book feels like it took a lot of inspiration from that, which is great for world building. It's just pretty graphic. I wouldn't recommend reading this book whilst you're eating. Lucas is taken to the tower and is tortured by Chaklock. He's then taken by a brute named Itacus, or Itarchus, to the Reverie, now of course Alpus Tremonius, to eventually open the Harbinger's Silex. Now, when he touches the pad on the Silex, it says that it burns his hand cold, and I can't help but think that that was a foreigner designed countermeasure to prevent this very thing from happening, considering they tried to erase any history of the Endless, they wouldn't want anyone getting to the Silexes to open them. Later, Lucas is then taken to the House of Reckoning to see the Harbinger again, where, after a gargantuan amount of physical torture, mental torture, and starvation at the tower, He's actually fed, and thus begins one of the Halo Infinite audio logs. This is what you brought me. There's barely anything left. It's yours to do with as you see fit. Indeed, it is. Were you treated unjustly in this tower, human? We are not so different in this. I too know intimately of injustice. To be sentenced for crimes not your own. Please, I, I just want to Quiet. I shall talk and you shall listen. He's then taken back to the tower, where he's pretty much just falling apart physically and mentally in his cell. He's being sent in scene specifically thanks to his interactions with the Harbinger, and a few times in this book it's said how incredibly uneasy the Harbinger speaking to a human makes that human feel. It's said that her voice kind of simulates the feeling of having spiders crawling all over you. It messes with your brain in some very unsavory ways. Not gonna lie, that's some kind of primordial ancient human reference, I swear down. However, in the next cell is Spartan Griffin, who tries to calm and reassure Lucas. When Lucas tries to tell Griffin about the Harbinger, he physically can't get the words out, it's like something's in his head preventing him. All his mind can do is form numbers. Look, Lenny, I gotta know. What do the numbers mean? He's then taken to the House of Reckoning once again to meet with the Harbinger once again, in which this audio log plays out. How long has the human been this way, Jack? A matter of days. It seems their feeble minds cannot contain the power of her words. Close space. They're off limits. They're still there. They were still there. The only ones. You should feel honored, human. The truth has apparently set you free. Price paid. The sentence given. We never knew. So old. So far. Bring him to her chambers. She has more to tell him. If his mind can last. And that's the last that we hear of Lucas Browning in this book. Now, I'm not going to lie, his chapters of this book really, really parallel the Jenkins chapters and sections of the Flood, like, so much. One of them is being tortured by the Flood, the other by the Endless, which, of course, is a very interesting parallel. Elsewhere on the ring, the survivors of the Reverie are scattered. Occasionally, they meet up with one another, but the reunions don't last long. 
Turns out that survival is better alone or in small groups. There's a word of mouth leaderboard of banished kills that's being kept among the squads that do reunite. There's a super hardened ODST unit called the Gravediggers that were extremely effective at taking out banished supply runners and raiding parties, Gravedigger spin-off game please, and another group called Hatriarchs that excelled in destroying structures. And then also, whoever kills Glibnub, the Grunt Minister of Propaganda coming through those towers, apparently gets top of the leaderboard instantly because he's always coming through their radios and demoralizing them. Eventually though, Spartan Sorel comes over the radio announcing the Rubicon Protocol is active. Rubicon Protocol is asset denial, doing whatever is necessary to deny Esherim control of Zeta Halo. And the Spartans say that this is pretty much shorthand for the fact that no help is coming and that they can either hide and cower or try and go out with the blaze of glory and stop the banished. Going back to Spartan Horvath briefly, after his fight with Gorion, he's left alone once again, gravely injured, and ends up becoming pretty much a lone wolf. He stumbles across the only asset recovery agent, Kate Stalling, of the Zeta Halo project that started in 2555, which was in Hunters in the Dark, who's in a cave, withering away and dying, but she tells him before she dies about certain facilities on the ring called Conspectus Network Hubs that Jaeger and Gorion are headed to. These hubs are data storehouses for system protocols and records of all activity on Zeta Halo, including its defensive protocols, which Ashram needs to control the ring. Horvath follows a map that Kate gave him to find the Conspectus hub and eventually does, descending through a pit in the center of a lake to reach it. Going back to Spartan Stone, Spartan Kovan and co, they see a large banished force moving back to the Reverie site with one of Eshram's personal craft included, and so they follow it back, and it's here where Stone makes her final descent into the facility, one final time. In there, she follows Jaeger and Gorion to one of the Conspectus network hubs, where she can see that they're retrieving what's called a Siloge node, which is basically a data node which they're going to give to Esherim so he can control the ring's defences. Now, after a long, long fight, that honestly, I recommend reading the book purely so you can read this fight because it's so well done, uh, Stone manages to take out a whole squad of Banished on her own, but she's eventually stabbed in the back by Jaeger, who taunts her as she bleeds out. However, before she died, she managed to steal that Siloge node from Jaeger and corrupt its data, denying him the prize he wished to present to Esherim. And of course, this is the first Dev Spartan that we find in Infinite's campaign. Later, Spartan Coven and some of the crew members find Stone's body, along with a new sub-monitor, 091 Adjutant Veridity, who informs them that Cortana is dead, but that she sequestered Despondent Pyre, Zeta Halo's primary monitor, and that the humans need to free her. And then, at the Conspectus Hub, they run into Spartan Horvath. They share stories about the Spartans that they knew of on the ring, and we find out that Spartan Vettel went after Griffin, and Spartan Sorel and Mako went off trying to find out why the ring was repairing itself. As we know, the Reformation. They also find out that there's in fact enough data left in that silo's node to transmit Zeta Halo's coordinates back to human space using a beam tower, but they first need to free Despondent Pyre so they can gain access to the towers. So, they go to the conservatory, which it turns out is actually designed specifically like a maze with such a confusing layout to confuse those who enter without invitation, just like the Banished do. As they descend, they go through hallways with streaming blue code in them, which is a reference to Epitaph, which is a, such a cool aesthetic, I'm really happy they brought that back. And they eventually reach Despondent Pyre, who gives them a key to access the beam towers and send a superluminal message with the ring's coordinates back to human space so they can call for reinforcements. When they reach the closest beam tower, they come under heavy assault from the banished, including Gorion and Jaeger, but manage to fire the message off reaching human space, which means that technically, as of the date of Halo Infinite's campaign, reinforcements have technically been requested. Someone in human space should have picked up that message, which means someone, something should be on the way to help us, maybe at some point, who knows. Back to the beam tower, Horvath fights and kills Gorion, who in fact fights with a brute shot and a bandolier, which is a very, very Halo 2 aesthetic that I love. However, he's teleported away alone as he does so, and Adjutant Veridity teleports Coven and the other remaining survivors away before Jaeger can kill them. In the end, 
Coven and her survivors plan to liberate the tower and save Lucas, and Horvath is stranded in a snowy mountain range, where he radios for help. And so, those are all the details from the Rubicon Protocol about what happened on Zeta Halo while Chief was taking a very nice, very long nap in space. Honestly, I love this book. I really, really enjoyed it. Like I said at the start, basically the Flood, but for Infinite, which for me is a massive dub. If you want to go read it, then of course, I did an Audible sponsor a few videos ago. You guys know that by now. Audible is great, but also the cover art is fantastic, and it's done by Pixel Flare as well, who's been a good friend of mine now for such a long time. Incredibly talented artist, so I also recommend that you pick up the book as well if you can. Go and give this book a try, give it a read, see what you think, and let me know. So, with all that said, I'm going to round this video out here. I want to give a massive thank you to all of my amazing patrons for the support, as per usual, and thank you all so much for watching, I really appreciate it, and I'll catch you all in the next one.